And uh, the next presentation is, is uh, going to be almost the opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, it's, to, it's to explore and uh, provide you with some understanding of the design community, the structural design community. Um, after that, we'll be by some presentations relative to the semantic web technologies to then give some of the material scientists and the designers a little bit better appreciation of what the capabilities are associated with semantic web technologies. And then with all of that information, as we go into the breakout sessions, you guys will have all the answers for all the pieces to the puzzle to create all the answers that we need uh, as we move forward. So I'm looking forward to uh, some great solutions here in the workshop. Uh, Ray Blone is from, uh, well, I actually want to say Air Vehicle Director, but that's, uh, that's done by the, done by the right side. Yeah, but you're a space system.
So we want to make better informed decisions or informed decisions earlier in the process. So we're trying to develop and trace technology to mission level capability impact based on physics. So if you start over here in the far left, we're actually pretty good at developing technology. We've got a lot of smart people that think of wonderful ideas. So different types of technology, and multidisciplinary technologies, uh, things like active barrel elastic wing, flutter suppression, uh, advanced materials, which we're talking about here, uh, thrust vectoring, things of that. Technologies are very easy, well, not easy, but we get a lot of good ideas. The next level is, is that, well, we are pretty good at, if we're using physics-based analysis and design, we can determine the engineering impact, meaning that what the impact the material has on the weight of the structure that we can account for or calculate. Uh, so weight reduction, some aero technologies, what impact does that have on drag reduction? So we can uh, quantify computationally the impact on engineering capabilities or engineering parameters. But really the Air Force doesn't care about that. You work your way up the Air Force chain of command, what they're really interested in is mission capability impact. Kills per dollar, IDs per dollar, what does it cost me to sustain it? You know, what are the life cycle costs? Those are the types of things that the Air Force leadership wants to talk in. So we need to be able to map our technology into mission capability. And what we really want to find is the partial derivative of mission effectiveness with respect to the partial derivative of the technology. All right, so at a very high level, that's what we're trying to do. So we're developing multidisciplinary technologies, multidisciplinary methods to account for those technologies in the design process, but in the end, from an Air Force perspective, it's what does this technology do for my mission? So how do we bring the high fidelity multidisciplinary design into pre-milestone A in the acquisition process? And we're trying to do, well, I'll talk about the KPPs later, but first of all, whenever you do traditional conceptual design, which you have here, is, is that you pick a technology suite, and they typically represent it with what they call K factors. They just knock up and knock, up, knock down factors on these conceptual equations. And it's very easy for them to do thousands of configurations at the conceptual design level. And that's zero for order of fidelity. No physics are included in it. It's just based on historical information for the most part. Then what they do is, is that they will down select based on whatever information they got from the conceptual studies. And typically, they only pick one, maybe two configurations to do this high-fidelity physics-based assessment on those configurations. That's a problem, because they're making decisions early on in the process, and down-selecting, they're not informed based on physics. It's just based on historical information. And a lot of the configurations and technologies that we're trying to evaluate do not appear in the historical databases. The new, the new configurations, you know, it's a hypersonic vehicle, it's a joint wing vehicle, it's a tail of supersonic vehicle. None of the data, none of those have ever been real, so there's no historical data to tell us how those are going to perform. So what we want to try and do is bring tens of configurations forward to do a detailed design or a preliminary design and assessment based on physics instead of one or two, which industry does today. And that's what this KPP, there's two up here. We want to reduce the design side to time, but also we want to bring, say, 15 configurations forward with the same resources. Whenever we make this statement to industry, they say, oh, I can bring 10 forward, just multiply my budget by 10, and I'll be fine. Well, that's not the answer. We have to be able to do that assessment with the same amount of resources in the same amount of time. So, uh, also at the conceptual design level, that, you know, we're talking about materials here. How do they represent materials? Well, they don't. They either say that it's metallic or it's composite. And if it's metallic, they, they don't put any factor on the weight equation for the vehicle. If it's composite, they'll say, well, maybe it's going to save me 15%. So they'll go into the weight equation, put 0.85 in the weight equation, and away I go. That's how they address materials at the conceptual level. Now, at the uh, higher fidelity assessment, so we've got a model for design first, and then we do our analysis for design. And again, this is the appropriate level of fidelity. At least at this point, we're actually uh, calculating the vehicle response and the mission capability based on physics. And the way materials is used here is, is that we'll start picking materials. So we need material properties. But we're not designing materials. We just need the material properties, the E, the G, uh, strain allowable, stress allowable. That's the type of information that we use to bring forward into the 
design process here. So it will pick a material and then we'll evaluate how it uh, performs. So once we're able to do analysis for design, then we do design space exploration. Whenever we talk about design parameters here at this point, we're talking about aerodynamic design parameters, plan form, airfoil parameters, uh, things of that nature, then also structural topology, how many ribs and spars do we have, and then sectional properties. What are the moments of inertia? What are the thicknesses? The vision would be, well, how do we bring some of those material property design variables into this process? So we can actually design the materials at the same time, not just pick the given material. And we call that multi-scale. So we're doing multidisciplinary. But if you want to start bringing material properties design variables in, now you have to add uh, multi-scale into this process as well. So the other thing we do is, is that after we're able to do this high fidelity assessment, we do testing as well. We want to determine whether or not our methods are working properly. Do they predict the performance that uh, properly we're trying to get? And then also we want to uh, test configurations. Does that joint, joint weight configuration actually give us the weight and the drag that we were predicting? Yeah. So we're about getting more information, get better information, and get it early in the process so we can make these informed decisions so that we can tell the Air Force leadership, okay, which technologies do you need to invest in to get the capability that you want at the mission level? So at a high level, what are we trying to do? Well, we're really trying to merge conceptual design with aspects of preliminary design because it's at the preliminary design level that you start seeing that level one, level two fidelity starting to come into the process. Conceptual design has a level zero. But a lot of the design parameters at the conceptual level are the aerodynamic parameters that are frozen. So the configuration is frozen, then we're just left with some of the structural parameters of the design. We find that to be subtle. But here you just see some of the disciplines that we're working on and considering. Uh, we've done a lot of work coupling aerodynamic structures and controls. Uh, we're now starting to bring propulsion in over there in the far right, EEWS is engine exhaust wash structures. Anybody that's familiar with the BQF deck problems know what the couple of physics and the problems are associated with that. System thermal management is a big deal. We don't do cost modeling, but we know cost is important and we have to consider it. And then you see down there in the right hand corner, materials is on there. How do we bring materials, materials design? into this uh, design process. And that starts leading to not necessarily multidisciplinary, but multi -scale. So what's the impact if we're able to do this? Well, we have classified impact into two areas, scientific impact and acquisition impact. Scientific impact is that if you can exploit that synergy of those mutually interactive disciplines through the company, you can produce a capability that cannot be obtained otherwise. And there's a few examples here. The X-29 is a forward swept wing. What they had to do here was couple uh, aerodynamic structures and controls to create a weight competitive forward swept wing. You cannot get that capability without coupling those disciplines. Uh, another one there, this is the X-53 in the middle there, that's the active aeroelastic wing demonstrator. What they produced there was the roll performance of a vehicle by coupling aerodynamic structures and control uh, while reducing the weight of the vehicle considerably and increasing the drag. And that increases, or decreasing the drag increases the range. And then over on the far right hand side there, I have the F-22. They actually use what's called aeroelastic tailoring, which is using composite materials uh, to uh, manipulate the deformed shape under load that gave you better performance of the vehicle. So here are examples of what has been done. And we believe that if you're going to get hypersonic vehicles, high altitude long endurance, strike tanker, uh, Taylor supersonic, there's no way you're going to get those capabilities unless you do this multidisciplinary coupling. The other impact on the far right over there is that, well, if we can bring physics earlier into the design process, into the analysis, we can reduce the discovery of late defects due to physics. And the B2F deck I already pointed to, they did not design that properly because they couldn't analyze it properly because they weren't considering enough physics early in the design process to capture the phenomenon driving the design. And every one of those vehicles over there had some problem associated with not being able to model the physics that were driving the design. In particular, it's the loading environment, be it the aerodynamic loading, the thermal loading, the acoustic loading, and the coupling between those disciplines. And it's costing the Air Force billions of dollars to deal with those problems. 
So uh, I've got about five more minutes. I've got a few more slides. Here are some studies that also show you what the impact is of coupling these different disciplines and taking advantage of it and increasing the fidelity. The first, so we're looking at total, total gross, gross takeoff weight of some tailless vehicle, and we're looking at subsonic ratings. So we want low, low weight, high ratings, right? So we really want to be here on the plot. If you use traditional design methods, this is the plot that you get, okay? And it's actually pretty close to linear. If I'm trying to increase range, I increase total gross takeoff weight. Well, if we add some of these multidisciplinary technologies, and the first one is active bare elastic wing technologies, which is coupling aerodynamics and controls in a static sense, you can get a vehicle that performs like this. We've got lower weight for the same range, and then if you include active flutter suppression, you again get even a lower weight and a greater weight range. But look at the configuration. You start to see a much higher aspect ratio. Oops, the person. A much higher aspect ratio of wing than you see in this configuration here. And so this shows you that coupling these disciplines produces a different configuration altogether. Now, the one thing that I want to point out, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but what you don't see is you don't see a design for the zeroth order at this point here. And the reason is, is that it was unattainable. It would not close. You'd have to change the configuration drastically in order to get that performance. So really, the, uh, the weight savings here is infinite compared to traditional design because we were able to take advantage of the coupling of the disciplines. So another example of this is the impact expanding on the design space. We're just expanding the design parameters that are available. Uh, we have some engine parameters, engine cycle parameters, wing parameters, constraints. So if we just do a conventional conceptual design, we just have these three parameters and we get a gross takeoff weight of around 68,000 pounds. If we start increasing engine cycle parameters, just these additional parameters, now the weight comes down to 66,000. And if we in further increase wing parameters, we can get a, or a final weight there of about 62,000 pounds. And then if we start adding a couple of technologies, we can get a uh, further reduced weight, uh, again, showing the impact of using physics-based calculations and expanding the design space to degrees of freedom and the impact that that has on mission performance capability. And then here is another demonstration of these couple of physics. The top figure here is uh, nonlinear linear elastic uh, analysis. This is the couple of physics, but it includes active air elastic and active flutter suppression technology. And this is, I'm sorry, this is baseline technology here. This is AW and active flutter suppression. What I want you to watch here is the wing loop bending loop because that's what we're trying to address. We're trying to do the same flight maneuver that we want to reduce wing bending moment, and you'll see that we also get a significantly reduced weight. So this thing's doing an IMG pull-up, and we're using the control surfaces to uh, alleviate or manipulate the load, and it reduces the wing boot bending moment by, I think it's like 30%, which means we can reduce the structural weight based on it. So 32% reduction and 24% reduction in vehicle weight. We can't do this if we cannot couple the disciplines uh, in the design process. But these computations here are considered to be level two and level three because we're using computational fluid dynamics, and this takes days to run. Uh, I think I'm about out of time, so I'm going to just jump to the end here and just tell you where the bottlenecks are. Gaps to achieving this des desired process of multidisciplinary large scale multidisciplinary design. You know, we need rapid development of the models. We need to be able to couple these disciplines and account for them in a physics-based method. We need a computational framework that supports this. And that is the monster of all acronyms. That's multidisciplinary, multi-fidelity, multi-scale, analysis and optimization with uncertainty quantification. We want to be able to do all those things. And we need to put uncertainty and probabilistic design methods in and really changing the culture. So this is just a, 
a laundry list of some of the technologies, more specific technologies that we're after, but I'll be happy to answer any questions.